Welcome all of you to the Nashers 360 Speaker Series. Dallas Art Fair Weekend always presents to us an opportunity to take an in-depth look at a topic affecting the art world right now. This year, our panel will focus on the so-called alternative art fair, which may take the form of anything from a hotel pop-up to a gallery share to a high-profile collaboration that changes our definition of what an art fair is, who can present one, and who it is for. We are fortunate to have Andrew Russith joining us as our moderator today. Russith brings with him a wealth of insight about the burgeoning and rapidly changing alternative fair scene, and will introduce our other panelists and expand upon today's topic in just a moment. An art critic based in New York, Russith is co-executive editor of Art News. He previously co-founded and edited Gallerist New York, the New York Observer's website about the art world. His writing has appeared in W, New York, Modern Painters, Art in Auction, Bijutsu Teco, the New Yorker's website, as well as catalogs for exhibitions at museums and galleries. His blog about contemporary art and our history in New York, 16 Miles of String, has been supported by the Creative Capital Warhol Foundation Arts Writers Grant Program. On behalf of the Nasher, I thank you all for joining us today, and I'm sure you're as eager as I am to enjoy a lively and insightful conversation. Without further ado, please welcome Andrew Russith and share a warm round of applause for our panel. All right, Anna, thank you. Can everyone hear me? Am I on? Oh, yeah, I am. OK, good. Um, so yeah, Anna, thank you. And a big thank you to the Nasher. And thank you uh, all for being here. Uh, it's really exciting to see people who are willing to kind of talk and spend more time thinking about art fair as well and art fair is going on. Um, I'm going to introduce the panelists. And then I'm going to talk a little bit of kind of what we're going to get to. Uh, the panel will go about an hour. And when we have 15 minutes, 20 minutes left, We'll open it up for questions, so definitely be keeping that in mind. Uh, to my direct left is Elizabeth D, who is a cultural entrepreneur, curator, dealer, and producer. She's CEO of the Elizabeth D Gallery in New York and of independent art fairs in New York and Brussels. Uh, she's been profiled in many international publications, including the Wall Street Journal, Vogue, the New York Times as well. She regularly lectures on topics of relevance to the field, particularly gallery and fair culture, innovation, and the art market. Uh, Elizabeth D. Gallery was founded in 2002 in New York. Uh, Ms. D. has produced numerous groundbreaking internationally recognized exhibitions by renowned artists, including, and really this list is incredible, John Giorno, Adrian Piper, Julia Wachtel, Derek Jarman, and Ryan Tricartan, among others. Uh, previously, Ms. D created X Initiative, which was a nonprofit consortium of the global arts community, presenting exhibitions and programming in response to major philosophical and economic shifts in the contemporary art world. Um, some of you who visited New York may remember it. It was located in the former uh, Dia building in Chelsea. Uh, and she served as co-director of the Loring Augustine Gallery in New York before founding her gallery in 2002. Uh, she majored in studio art and critical social thought at Mount Holyoke in Massachusetts. And she served on the board of the Elizabeth A. Sackler Center for Feminist Art at the Brooklyn Museum. Uh, PIVO, which is an amazing, very interesting nonprofit that's located in Sao Paulo in the iconic Edific Edificio Copan. Uh, and she's an advisor to the I Impact Program for Arts Leaders at Stanford. Um, to her left is Nicola Vizel, who's the founder of Concept NV and a former director at Pace Gallery and Deitch Projects in New York. She specializes in curatorial programming, collection building, and the design of unique art acquisition, sales, and marketing strategies. Gallery program management and artist development are also core uh, to her work. Um, she works closely with the world's foremost artists and past collaborators include, and here the list is also incredible, uh, Tauba Auerbach, the estate of Basquiat, uh, Francesco Clemente, Latoya Ruby Frazier, Robert Irwin, Kerry James Marshall, Toyin Adutola, uh, Adam Pendleton, Sterling Ruby, Rakib Shah, Nari Ward, and Gehinde Wiley. Vizel fosters a large network of collector and museum relationships in Asia, Europe, the US, and Caribbean, as well as key relationships in the global music, film, fashion, and publishing industries. She forges sponsorships and brand partnerships and has facilitated many notable collaborations, including No Commission, which uh, we'll hear some about and has been held in Berlin and the Bronx, uh, Shanghai, 
uh, as well as Miami. Um, Bacardi, Converse, and Kehinde Wiley with the Puma World Cup. Uh, and Vizel also edits monographs and has organized numerous exhibitions, including No Commission, Black Eye, Subtraction, Jean Michel Basquiat, 1981, The Studio of the Street, Francesco Clemente Works, 1971 1979, Taba Auerbach, Here and Now and Nowhere, and Kehinde Wiley Down. Uh, and last but not least, to her left is Manuela Mozo. Uh, who in June 2017 uh, was named Director of Untitled Art, uh, leading uh, international development of its programming uh, and overseeing the curatorial and strategic vision of the fair, which uh, has events in Miami and San Francisco. Mozo was a partner at Simon Lee from 2013, uh, where she established the gallery's office in New York. And before that, uh, was director at two um, huge legendary New York galleries, Metro Pictures and Scarstead. Uh, Manuela holds a master's in contemporary art theory and cultural studies from NYU, and she is currently on the advisory board of RxArt. So to start off, I just a uh, round of applause for the panelists. <laughs> All right, so to jump into it, um, the panel, of course, is titled Going Rogue, which the Nasher came up with, and I was very excited about, um, not least because being a New York liberal and the fact that that's also the memoir, the name of Sarah Palin's memoir. Um, but I, I thought it really captured uh, the sensibility nicely because I think there is a pervasive <laughs> sense, and I was going around the Dallas Art Fair yesterday, uh, that our current fair system is broken. It's really a strange system that we've constructed for ourselves. Um, and so I thought I'm gonna really quickly uh, do a little kind of like history of the art fair and then we're gonna hear from the panelists and they're gonna take it away. Um, but it, it's interesting to be meeting now because essentially we're at the 50th anniversary of kind of what we conceive of as the modern art fair. We had Art Cologne open in 67, um, Brussels the year after that, and then of course the, the big kahuna Basel in 1970. Um, in 2000, according to Basel, which puts together a kind of market report by Claire McAndrew, in 2000 we had about 55 art fairs. So, you know, steady growth over the years. Um, since then, in the past 18 years since then, we're now at a point where there are 260 art fairs, which is, you know, insane. You know, and we've obviously had growth in the art business. There are more galleries, there are more MFA programs. Um, but this is, uh, you know, one dealer at the fair said yesterday that I should say that it's like a cancer growing. Um, but at the same time, you know, there, there are really positive things, and we'll get into the positive and negative of the art fair. Um, but incredible growth, 55 to over 260. Um, more and more galleries. Uh, and then if you ask dealers the percentage of income they're getting from uh, their fairs, uh, going to fairs, it's now something like 46%, 50%, whereas even only seven years ago, it was like 30%. So it's more and more a core of a business. Um, and yet when you talk to people, most people really hate doing fairs. I mean, I, I kind of wrote out a few quotes of, uh, of how they've been described. Um, the Economist quoted one unnamed art dealer saying that fairs are prisons for art, uh, or quote unquote, pop-up carnivals. Uh, and then we had a columnist, Art News, this is a little aggressive, but she called them uh, slaughterhouses. They're holding pens in which art gets chopped and bought. So slaughterhouses, prisons, cancers, bad things, bad things. Um, and yet, we do them and we kind of, you know, we're all here and we do love them because you make discoveries. Um, I'm gonna leave it at that for now because there are other things I wanna touch on. Um, but I thought, Maybe to start it out, and I'll, we'll just go in order here. Um, I wanted them quickly, each of the panelists, to talk a little bit about um, those, you know, those statistics, those things going on. The sense that you know the system's not working. Um, and I should add also, you know, when you ask dealers um, in, in surveys, what's your number one concern? They say, according to, to this UBS Basel report, 40% say that fair participation is a concern. Um, and it's a very dangerous thing because they're spending all this money. Um, so I'd start with Elizabeth. And if, if each of the panelists could kind of talk about um, where they fit into this landscape. And because and, each of the panelists, I should say, is, is doing things. I, I was excited to bring them here because they're all doing something a little bit different, um, rogue in different ways, alternative in different ways. So Elizabeth, we'll start with you. Well, thank you. Um, 
just to jump in to the to get the conversation moving more than anything i i I won't even uh, linger on the question of is the system broken? I think all of us that are here that are trying to break through some of the restrictive boundaries that you talked about are are here, and we all agree that we want to be innovators in this field and we want to bring things to a place of balance and sustainability, particularly for the galleries and the artists that they that they represent. So Independent was founded nine years ago as a gallery-centric model for the solution between the fair and the gallery and the gap, uh, which was moving to a more ahistorical position and a more market-centric position of the, of the market fair. Um, we were all doing market fairs. They have and still do have a purpose. Um, but we were seeing a growing gap in terms of development of, um, of the artists in the minds of new audiences that we were looking to build for our artists and also a just restriction of, uh, of conditions that were not healthy or interesting for our artists to be commissioned to make work for. So it really comes out of a really natural, organic, uh, you know, network of conversation, which is still going on to this day. And I think because we didn't have a grand ambition to have a global art fair enterprise, it gave us this freedom to uh, constantly push toward new innovations that were about listening to what the artists and the galleries that represent them needed and just trying to in every conceivable and possible way provide that and provide that with a sustainable support system. Um, so that's really where we, and we still have really remained pretty true to that model. Um, another thing I should say is we're invitation only. So that means we have a curatorial appointment. Our founding curator is Matthew Higgs, who is the director of the oldest nonprofit, artist run nonprofit in New York, White Columns. He's been with us for all of nine years. We're going into our 10th year next year, which is quite exciting. And he, um, you know, we'll, we'll make a, uh, a new edition every single year that really has a different framework. And so that allows us to rotate about 50 per, or 30% of our galleries are rotated uh, every year. Nothing is ex as expected. Uh, so people come, I think, with a really nice sense of anticipation about the next edition because it is always fresh and it is always interesting and hopefully will inspire people to, to get really into the content and the exhibitions that are being presented. Uh, last year, I think we had over 70% of our uh, exhibitors doing one or two person solo presentations, which was quite new for us, and that yielded something really interesting. Um, so Matthew is, it's an invite only situation, so it feels a little bit like a biennial in the way it's constructed. Uh, you know, there is a curator and there is works that are commissioned especially for our platform. There's a sense of surprise, which is something we don't see at a lot of fairs, right? Yeah. That's what we're hoping to do, and to extend the culture that we have had in the tradition of the gallery into spaces where we can welcome and receive new people and make you know more of a network and relationship-based uh, center for what we do. So if we're not in the gallery on a Saturday, I mean, when I started, 20 years ago, uh, you know, Saturday was a big deal. Everyone would come in, whether you were another artist, a critic, a curator, or a collector, and there would be debates in the, you know, in the gallery about the works that were on view. There would be books would be pulled out, artworks would be pulled out. There would be conversations, and and in that level of consensus and dialogue and learning and just kind of seeking uh, that interest is something that still happens, but it's something that we really have to um, protect and the, the global kind of crazy system that we have been kind of fed uh, with technology and travel and working in the way that people work now, it has really made this kind of time poor um, situation for many, many people, including the gallerists. So we wanted the fair to be a place where we could reestablish some of those values and also just put them into action. Yeah, absolutely. How about you, Nicola? Uh, Nicola? I mean, you're coming from a, it's a very different model in a way. Yes. I mean, I would say we are the absolute outliers of the entire enterprise, the art fair enterprise. In fact, I don't think we consider ourselves part of the sort of traditional art world, art fair circuit at all. I mean, um, 
first, I just want to thank Vinasha for having us and uh, Andrew for uh, moderating us. But I mean, effectively, no commission um, was birthed out of the brain of a collector. And uh, the collector Swiss Beats, who's the founder of the Dean Collection, he, he and his wife Alicia Keys, um, are sort of embarking on a very interesting uh, proposition relative to artists and the art of collecting. And so effectively, over the years, I think both of them being artists understood that there was a much greater plight of the artist at hand than had been fully integrated or understood by galleries and, um, you know, sort of the powers that are. And he felt very strongly that the artist was always sort of being left at home. So our fair model absolutely comes from the artist's support angle. And... Um, Effectively, we are highly experimental, and I was laughing with the ladies and with Andrew this morning. We don't effectively have any very sort of rigorous structure or schedule or uh, sort of appointments that we abide by. We simply are very, very questioning, very, very curious, and absolutely focused on supporting artists. So, effectively, you know, there it's 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 a multi partnership. So we've got a multinational, a huge brand underwriting. We've got the Bacardi Group underwriting. We've got Swiss, who as their sort of a global creative leader, led the charge of the concept. And then we formed this platform, which is effectively an art fair and a music festival combined in one. And what we do is we go from city to city around the world, and we build a, a kind of concept from which the presentation descends. So it's almost like a curated exhibition from which we sell. Then we hire a local team, of uh, a sales team. We speak to young youth, leader, youth leaders on the ground, and we begin to ask questions about what motivates, uh, you know, what are the angsts, what are the uh, strings of success and failure that you're thinking about. And we try to, um, you know, uh, formulate an idea. And from that idea, we invite local artists or artists internationally who embody the spirit of the idea to present work, we sell the work, and the artist keeps 100%. And then in the evenings, we have a curated music program that also speaks to the original concept. And so we've done six, six uh, shows in two years, which is unheard of for an art fair. You know, we've done Miami, the Bronx, we did London, Shanghai, Berlin, and we went back to Miami. And everything was really in the spirit of experimentation. And um, so primarily the artist is the winner at the end of the day. But then, of course, there are other partners. So the brand must get its message across. At the, the absolute focal point of this is also what it takes to communicate to a much larger audience. So democratic engagement is very important to us. We're not speaking only to the art world. We're speaking to much more diverse audience and also people who might not traditionally feel comfortable coming into museums or art, art world spaces. And so um, that's been a very interesting angle for us. Also, a high digital uh, engagement, so the tapping influencers and the entire sort of millennial um, lexicon to drive our message forward is what's important. So it's really a democratization experiment as well as an artist support platform. How have you picked places? Why, was that uh, <laughs> Swiss Beats? Or? It's a combination of brand um, and Swiss and sort of we, we think both about what's necessary for marketplaces, but also what's fresh and exciting. Where isn't there like a sort of major art fair right, already? Right. Or where can we go back and look? Who's experiencing interesting cultural shifts? I mean, we had that experience in Shanghai. You know, you think about the new media landscape there. So it's a multitude of things, not one being more important than the other. Great, great. And Manuel, how about you? Because un Untitled is, in some sense, it's a more traditional uh, fair as opposed to the other two ventures we're talking about. But at the same time, um, has, I think, cut out a very distinctive role um, within, within the art world and also in terms of its expansion. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, walk us through it. Untitled was founded in 2012, and am I bouncing back? I hear. Me. Okay. Um, and it was developed at a time when the idea of an architecturally designed fair was new, and that was really the initial approach. Also, 
it was unique in that it was a curator vetted fair. It was not a peer group making the selection of the galleries. Curators were put in place and they vetted the applications. I think a lot has changed in the last 10 years and now curatorial and architectural elements are a lot more common, but back then it was pretty unique. Um, and the other thing that Untitled really always prided itself on was its collaboration with nonprofits. To begin with, we team up um, in both cities, Miami and San Francisco, with local nonprofits and do in-kind exchanges of space for programming or other forms of collaboration. Um, and that was, has been our way to really sort of connect with the cities in which we are um, exhibiting. We also do a lot of outreach to government organizations and, and art groups that help fund younger emerging galleries from various countries because as we all know right now there's a lot of financial pressure and it's very challenging for smaller galleries. It's very important for us to keep a very exciting new element in our fairs so that's another way that we try to tap in and stay relevant within the younger gallerist community. Great, great. Um, Elizabeth, you, you raised, uh, you were saying in passing that in starting independent, um, you were thinking a lot about what you were hearing for deal, from dealers. Um, and I was hoping you could kind of expand on that, but then also um, I'm curious to hear from everyone, kind of for your exhibitors, uh, looking over the past three, four years, um, in the past, kind of what are the changes that dealers have seen or what dealers are talking about in terms of um, doing fairs? I think at the beginning it was really, you know, we started in 2010, but the discussion started in 2009. So you have to imagine that was when we were feeling the global financial crisis. Yeah. So it was so much of, uh, how are we even going to see a future market for all of the artists that we want to develop um, if we can't find a way to make this more interesting uh, for us and potentially also more transparent uh, and more dynamic um, because we have to do something different. Than, it was almost a sense of what had been happened before 2008 was it completely behind us mm. and we were embarking in a new time and that that new time had a new generation we were still you know in our mid you know early to mid 30s as a generation of galleries discussing this but we also had older gallerists who really were uh, our models as galleries and we had fairs that were our models for fairs but they didn't exist anymore like the unfair in Cologne for instance mm. which was a huge model for us or Maureen Paley, who, you know, was an important model for, or Gavin Brown in New York, of, of keeping the tradition of the gallery and the culture of the gallery in the gallery for the artists and really building a true community that was sustainable. So we started to really look at what was working. And then the biennial uh, high point was at that point mm -hmm. as well. So we had this kind of peak of the global biennials. And many of our artists were making some of the most important projects of their careers for these biennials, and they were selling events for us as galleries. Mm. So we thought, well, that's interesting. Would it be important to be able to leverage the potential of that kind of platform in the biggest art market in the world, which is New York City? Um, and so that's how that began. I would say fast forward, we still maintain that. The only difference about independent is that we have not had um, these things like the Gramercy Fair when it was in the hotel, which is one of my favorite, you know, all-time experiences I've ever had, uh, and the unfair, which I unfortunately was not around to, to witness, but is to me in my mind this kind of legendary art fair, um, they're not meant to last mm. beyond their moment and beyond that. And so I think what we surprised us as much as surprised everybody else is there was such a demand and appetite from the moment we did this that there wasn't a reason to let it just become a moment. It actually, there was already a drive that it, from many fa factions of the art world, not just collectors, but also the community, that this continue. And so it just became that. I would say, the, and so what we've been able to do is be in a really intensive dialogue with a wide range of dealers from the most established blue chip mega dealers that sometimes do our project to the most, you know, 
emerging, exciting, talented young galleries that are coming up and uh, have incredible curatorial instincts. And to level that playing field has been so critical for us. Mm. But I would say all of them across the board I, are unified in the focus on the escalating costs mm. of these fairs. And, you know, it doesn't matter what sector of the market you are in, it is a really important point. And, um, and I think that it's created uh, a sense of value for what independent is. Is that better? Sorry. So independent can really be a, um, an, a place where we can continue to try and bring those costs into alignment. So, you know, I don't know what the statistic is in terms of how art fairs have grown in terms of their costs, but I know as someone that still participates in those market fairs that, um, you know, it is not fiscally sustainable for galleries to bring emerging uh, artists to those fairs um, because of those costs, and and I think that that's we're seeing a an imbalance in the system that I think it's important to correct. But galleries do feel that they're working for the art fair costs, they're working for their landlord, and they're mm. working for the shipping companies, and and this is not this is reaching such a high level of stress. Uh, particularly for you know a majority of the galleries that are single venue galleries that don't have you know a global enterprise and a multinational corporate approach, it's really become a huge issue and it's something that we're really working hard to address and bring to light in conversation. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, I I had read one statistic that the increase in fair cost to 2017 compared to just the year before was up something like 15 percent something like that um and it also brings to mind i was reading an interview with a dealer uh who compared kind of the cost of doing fairs over the course of a year to essentially the equivalent of having another space mm -hmm. that's kind of the commitment um and so as a as kind of a critic when i put my like art viewing cap on uh, and as someone who travels to some fairs, but not a tremendous number, I always think like, gosh, I'd kind of prefer a second gallery in some of these cases. You know what I mean? A good, these good art dealers, like give them more space and let, them, let it rip rather than have to spend all this money on these kind of four-day affairs. Um, but I, I'd open it up. I'd ask Nicola and, uh, and Manuel as well. What have kind of past three, four years, what have been the big changes um, it's obviously different with no commission because you're dealing with artists. Um, but what have those kind of conversations been like about costs specifically, I guess? Um, well, yes, we sort of sit at the periphery of that kind of conversation simply because our model is very, very different from the traditional art fair. We are literally underwritten by a global, a multinational, um, by the Bacardi Group, who yeah. has interest in being connected with the arts in a more patron-driven way than their traditional marketing mm -hmm. um, you know, output would, would portend anyway. Um, effectively, I mean, I mean, I'll speak perhaps more to the relationship between the dealers and the artists and that whole um, uh, ecosystem because effectively the dealers were at first quite wary of what we were presenting because our model cuts them out. Right. Our model sort of says, here, artists, you get a very cool, interesting, conceptually driven show to exhibit your artwork in, and we will uh, assemble a very strong, robust team to sell your work, and you keep 100% of the proceeds. That is terrifying news, right? Right. <laughs> However, I think what happened was that people realized that you know we weren't trying to come in to take over the space or to minimize or diminish the very hard work of the galleries, but that we were, would simply be an additive. Mm. And that because we focus specifically on digital outreach and expanding audiences, that suddenly you had amplification that traditional uh, art fairs might not possess. You know, we have a celebrity at the helm, fa you know, front-facing the project, and we have like cool musicians, and so suddenly you have this amplification potential that hadn't existed, and so artists were beginning to see their names popping up in corners that hadn't existed. So galleries began to understand that this was a compliment rather than um, a sort of like an offensive. You yeah, know? and it sounds like you're just bringing in tremendous new people. 
Yeah. First time our collectors. Yes, knew, yeah. absolutely. So we, and Elizabeth, we talked a bit about this. We began to identify a really interesting group of people who were willing to buy art who had just never been connected with the art buying experience. Mm. So that all those things combined gave us hope that there were absolutely other ways of approaching how you present and uh, the whole dynamic of interacting with art, buying, selling, exhibiting, and that putting the onus perhaps on the artist a little bit, you know, letting them to think about how difficult administratively these things are and sort of, you know, getting deeper down the rabbit hole in the logistical process. I think that's exposed them perhaps more clearly to the hard work of the gallery than they would if the gallery just does all the hard work. So, sure. yeah. Sure. Yeah. How about you, Manuela? What's been changing in the, <clears throat> the past few years? I think coming from the gallery side and yeah. now being on the fair side, I have the sort of the luck to have both experiences. I think it's time, money, fatigue, uh, stress on staff, stress on artists. Yeah. Um, fairs are still very critical, especially for smaller galleries. Uh, emerging programs, young artists, but because their price points are lower, it makes it much harder for the gallery to financially sustain a, a robust art fair yearly schedule. And, and at the same time, the art fairs afford the opportunity for gallerists and young artists to be introduced to major collections and institutions and foundations. So I think that People have to think a lot more about their strategizing regions, um, co new collector bases, um, institutional relationships, um, because most galleries just have much smaller staffs. And you know, we know galleries that do 30 fairs a year, and they have a team in place to do that. But an average size gallery is anywhere from three to 10 people. So you put them on a rotating global travel schedule and they no longer have a personal life or much else <laughs> other than art fairs. Yeah. So I think, I think what Elizabeth was saying is that there is a lack of balance um, both on the business side and on just a personal sustainability side. Absolutely. Um, a few threads coming out of that. I mean, I've heard it uh, from, I think, almost everyone at this point on the panel that, I mean, there's just this sense that, um, you know, you, the, the idea was always to go to the art fair and you would discover young artists, right? That is like the ultimate goal. Um, and I'll just speak personally, like what's funny is I find more and more uh, that now I kind of go and it's the historical stuff I discover in a way, um, because so often, you know, young dealers have to bring the market tested goods. Um, and so whereas, you know, I can go to the ADA art show, um, I can go to the Basels, of course, and kind of, you know, the deeper cuts, like the weird Paul Tech painting that Green Naftali pulls out, or uh, even at the Dallas Art Fair, you know, seeing like the Great Faith Ringgolds, like amazing, amazing stuff. Um, but at a certain price point where if, you know, if those sell, you can really uh, be doing pretty well for the fair. Um, and just like another anecdote I would share is, um, I remember this was a few years ago now, but, um, uh, and I'll, I won't use names or anything, but a, a New York dealer said, uh, I, I saw that they just got into one of the big fairs. And I should say, like, when we're saying big fairs, we're thinking, like, Freeze, Basel, and then, you know, kind of everything else is an alternative in my mind. Uh, you know, the 10 big fairs. Uh, but this, they got into one of the really big ones, and I was like, congratulations, that's really exciting. Um, and this dealer was like, yeah, I get to spend, you know, $150,000 and potentially never see a dime from that. Um, so all of which is to say there's just tremendous stress uh, on young dealers um, and I'm wondering, and, and throw this out to the panel, I mean, how do we make sure that unusual, weird, um, not market-tested artists get shown hmm. in these environments where fi collectors clearly are, right? Because collectors aren't going to, like, Chinatown, regrettably. Some are, some are, but most are not, you know. I think you have to set up a, an environment that supports a focus on those maverick positions mm. uh, and that's what I think our perspective is is that that that's 
in some ways where the most exciting scholarship is happening right now. Uh, it's where the markets are the most undervalued, so there's an opportunity for collectors, but also a, di a discovery element or an emancipata emancipation for curators to come in and, and do some interesting work and make a, make a contribution at an early stage. So mm. I think that has, is the best way. I mean, the, the gallerists are so talented. I mean, they are curators, they are art historians, they are uh, change agents for artists. They bring, you know, the awareness, the global awareness of an artist from one level to another. And, you know, it's, it's, it's a political campaign. It's like running for office. You know, you have to have the, the PR element positioned correctly. You have to have the strategy around the collectors to make sure that there's sustainability there for growth over a period of years and milestones of achievement. And, I mean, all of this is so importantly, important and complex. It's, if it were any other industry, there'd be like, you know, five five subfields for this kind of work you mm -hmm. know He's, and and there is very people are not doing this for the money hmm. they're doing it for uh the the sense of possibility that they envision uh for a world that includes this artist in a in an appropriate uh, uh, kind of focus and context and, and belief. And I think that's really still the case. And the more we hear the stories of the gallerists, the more that we understand the programs and why they choose the artists they choose. Uh, it's sort of like understanding a program of a museum or mm -hmm. understanding a generation coming out of a certain territory that we didn't have the opportunity to be a part of. I mean, this is where those real, that's where the real stories are in the fair. Mm. And it's not about a market validation uh, push. It really is about that for 99.9% .9 of the galleries and the artists that they show. And I think there's an opportunity on every platform for that to be more present. Yeah, yeah. It's so interesting because I think it, we always come back to this idea of time um, poverty, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. this thing of time poverty in our day and age and, you know, what constitutes like a really full, rich experience. And, to, you know, going to the, the article, we, you know, we all read uh, uh, Jose from team and, you know, w sort of walking a fair and you take three, four hours and, you know, suddenly you can't take the sort of maybe traditional um, route that connoisseurship requires to sit and really understand what is so extraordinary about this Paul Tech and who is Paul Tech and you know and is it then that there needs to be something about um, there being more of less you know and I think that inherently is um, something that sort of the art fair model has rejected you know every time you look it's a, you know, more galleries, more halls to walk down. And yes, that really creates absolute poverty of like, um, like, you know, the ability to be curious and to dig deeper. And galleries work so hard to coordinate these programs, build context, and then present these works in the fairs for your, your pleasure and for your sort of like, you know, um, intellectual extension. And then it's like you have two hours and you rip through and whatever satiates the immediate market impulse is what wins. And I think it's just an inherently philosophical challenge of, you know, existential crisis. So, um, yeah, I'm not sure I have a solution per se. I completely agree with what you're saying. It, we had talked about this and I was on a panel um, last week at NYU with your colleague and uh, um, Wendy from PPOW said, you know, we used to go to fairs and bring kind of a loose selection of inventory, i.e. stripping wasn't that expensive, was mm. my takeaway. Mm -hmm. And we used to just in the moment feel how the work looked in context to each other by different artists. And then that's how we made our decision about mm. what got hung in the presentation. And that world is over. I mean, mm. the costs are so high now. The time, as, as Nicola was saying, is so, so precious that, you know, it is like a stealth operation. I mean, you, <laughs> you have done yeah. five 3D models. You have <laughs> laid tape on the floor of the gallery. You've actually pulled the works and positioned them for weeks in the viewing room of the gallery to make sure that things are, things are really going to look as you think they're going to look. I mean, there is, there's like zero millimeter for error on yeah. every level. And yeah. I think that... Uh, you know, 
when we look at gallerists that you know, you know, like Daniel Reich, who I was very close with, who you know, who's unfortunately no longer with us, or Hudson, who's you know, sure. from Feature Gallery, you know, there was a time and place where, um, you know people who didn't want to spend the majority of their time focusing on that millimeter of error, you know, could actually sh show up alongside, you know, on these platforms and thrive. And, mm. and that is what we have to continue to, you know, many of the gallerists, myself included, were once artists or right. art students who have come into the practice. So we have to keep, um, we have to change the system because otherwise we're going to lose those special people um, who need to be with us and, and presenting work with their unique point of view. Yeah, yeah. Um, that makes me think, I mean, I, I think the three of you are all running fairs that have just very distinctive identities and I think successfully do that. You know, there are surprises. Uh, there's a diversity of voices. Uh, I mean, I don't, I don't want to keep harping on the UBS Basel report, but it said that, uh, I mean, the numbers are just astonishing at it. They said that it, 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 the average fare, the work is like 78% male, I believe, 75, 78% male, uh, which granted, like, if you look at New York gallery representation, it is about the same. So it's like, we're kind of just reinforcing these things, um, but it's also the most predictable names and so forth. Um, uh, but I do wonder, I mean, in terms of different models, do you all have um, the sense that, I mean, there are, there are things going on like gallery share programs, like Condo, um, which is a program some people might be familiar with um, that started in London and kind of invites dealers from other cities to come take over spaces. And then there's kind of a trade back and forth. Um, like a high-end couch surfing, sort of. Um, and it's now been replicated in Germany. It's called Okie Dokie. There's even one in Warsaw. Um, and it seems exciting, but I'm wondering, do you have confidence that kind of those other gallery weekends mechanisms could replace the fair to a degree? Or what role do those play? They might replace some. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and I just want to jump back for one second because when we were talking about sort of the, you know, how do we make sure we keep showing like young, supporting young artists. I'm really nervous about young galleries mm. um, in New York and London, which I'm most familiar with. They're closing at a pretty rapid rate, having sort of gone through these boom years where real estate has become very expensive. Um, so things like condo, I think, are brilliant, but I'm worried that the the very mm -hmm. genesis of the platform where young artists have opportunities to make mistakes and edit and grow is getting smaller. Mm -hmm. And so they are getting pushed to fairs sooner, which is not necessarily a good thing. That's interesting. You That's know, there used to be a time and place where artists could edit, they could make work, and they could, for six months or a year or as long as they wanted, right. just sit with it, mm -hmm. rework it, but that, because of the schedule of our sort of global art market, doesn't exist anymore. So people are just making, and to the models... I clearly remember the year where we started making the foam core models and like this to scale. <laughs> and it, and I was thinking about why did we start doing that? I mean, it was certainly very helpful to plan your shipment, but I think it's, it marked a time where you went from one to three fairs to six to eight. And all of a sudden you, you know, your roster at the time, let's say 20 artists, you're like, how do we ask? Who do we ask? Yeah. Um, what do we present in these cities? And you had to really strategize that early on. There was less room for the galleries to be experimental yeah. simply because there wasn't material available to just be so generous in all the events. Yeah. No, that's an astonishing point. Yeah, I mean, just to think about that the raw amount of art that is being created mm -hmm. for these in a way. I mean, uh, David Zwerner, right, he has, I, I kind of knew it was all over once, web, once galleries started putting the art fair tab on their website. It was like, oh, God, because the art fair always struck me as kind of like the, 
I mean, I'm not running a business, as you can tell clearly, but it kind of, it's like the thing you, it's like the thing that you like, you don't brag about in a way. You're like, oh, I had to do the art fair, and that's how I made a lot of money, and I could then do these interesting things, which I will feature on my website. And then once the art fair tab came on the website, so it's like, oh boy, we're doomed. Um, but I think the point you bring up is so good that the fact that, you know, De how old was de Kooning when he had his first show? He was like, 48 or something. I mean, yeah. that worked. He turned out to be okay. He didn't have to go to art fairs. Um, but, uh, yeah, it, it's an astonishing thing to think through. Um, I guess I, I would now just ask people to kind of like turn forward. I mean, Manuela, as we were preparing the panel, um, reminded me of a fair called The Bridge that was done out in the Hamptons, which was kind of an interesting model, and it was kind of at a weird golf course, and of course it's smart to do a fair in the Hamptons because there's a lot of rich people there, but it was interesting and combined, it was only like five galleries, six I think. Six galleries, I think. Six, yeah, yeah, six galleries, and they also they had like a car component in a way, um, and it just struck me that, I mean, it, um, you know, perhaps a future is in also specializing in a way, which all of you do. Um, so that, to me, like looking forward to something that strikes me as a potential optimistic way forward that really kind of fares at focus that say, you know, we're going to uh, do this one thing really well rather than try to be a bazaar with 300 galleries of varying quality. Um, but all of which is a prologue to say, looking ahead five, ten years, um, where do you see the fair landscape going? Are we going to see fewer galleries doing fairs? Are we going to see, or galleries doing fewer fairs? Um, are we going to see fewer fairs? What, what do you expect? Well, I, I think what you said about the specialization could be also, that case could be made for the galleries. Mm. You know, I think that the gallerists that uh, have a unique point of view are the ones that are going to survive. Mm -hmm. Um, I think that there will be a lot of talented people who have run galleries that want to do something beyond the model of the gallery. Mm -hmm. um, and I, you know, I think Independent has been really a, a pioneer in this. Like we invited, you know, Anthony Reynolds and Jay Gorney, um, you know, important veteran gallerists for decades who for one reason or another, wanted to work differently without running a space and continue to have a great track record in doing shows in other people's spaces or finding spaces to do shows. So you know, we invited those, those uh, gallerists. I still consider them gallerists without their a space that you go visit them um, to do independent. And they were some of the most memorable presentations because they had the time to devote six months. It was the only thing they were doing all year. So mm -hmm. what you saw from that research and, and building a, uh, an exhibition for the fair was, was so high quality and so, mm -hmm. so, so appreciated. Um, so I think we're going to see more of that. Mm -hmm. uh, and I don't think that's a bad thing. I think we should embrace that. Uh, I think that gallery weekends are going to be essential because galleries are still time poor in terms of maintaining the culture of their community in their gallery every single day. It's an incredible effort to do that. So being able to work with other galleries to do it together and then be able to work with another galleries in another city to bring some kind of inject sort of a new twist on that, I think it makes a lot of sense. However, you're still maintaining um, the exact same mailing lists. So I think that fairs will always have a place mm -hmm. as a way to extend the network to people that you haven't yet met, the people you haven't yet reached, the museums that haven't yet acquired your work of your artists or position you know, good museum shows around your artist's work. So I think that there's always going to be a sense of focus, anticipation, and urgency around the fair. And it really is the only alternative to the auction house. Uh, and it's definitely a more artist-centric model. Uh, so I think that gallerists and fairs have to work even more closely mm. together mm. to solve these problems. Uh, right now, there's a lot of uh, antagonism between the market fairs, thank God we're not in that category, uh, and the galleries. Um, and I think that's prohibitive. I think that we should be working together to innovate the problems in the gallery system, the problems in the fair system, and reach a, a position where we can get that balance back. I totally agree with, with what Elizabeth is saying. I think fundamentally it comes down to more communication between sort of the galleries and the, um, and the fairs because effectively there are perhaps maybe some like regulatory moves that could be made or ways that one can manage, you know, uh, sort of manage the, the, 
the material costs of doing these fairs that aren't being looked at from a more collective stance. And then further, you know, also this idea of sort of micro-targeting, you know, rather than like the blast off art fair in different cities. And this is something no commission is thinking about as we continue to transition. How do you um, um, sort of like, you know, grab small communities, mm -hmm. you know, in a city and say, okay, let's do our own little gallery weekend and get some energy for the walk-in buyer again. How do we turn back the time a little bit and say, come back to our brick and mortar space? Mm -hmm. And further down, I still think that there is an absolute play digital for the digital landscape. I think all these things can exist. And by that, I mean, I think the art world may need to contend with um, uh, another tab in its whole sphere in that, okay, there's a very sort of purist, what Jose calls the obnoxious world. And then there is a place for a more democratized version where there is add to cart buying yeah. and where people want to buy on Instagram. That, that is a very real and super profitable um, play it doesn't appeal necessarily to our highest, like, you know, brows, but at the end of the day, it's something very real. So I think there is an opportunity to actually, um, you know, thread it all together and yeah. possibly digital, see. democratic, yes. a variety of yes, yeah. micro community organizing, and then more discussion between the galleries and the art fairs. Yeah. yeah. How about you, Manuela? I agree with both of them. Um, I don't know what in 10 years the landscape will look like, honestly. I think that it's rapidly shifting. And that's not to say that brick and mortar will cease to exist, because I think it will. But you know, we also have new sort of power positions coming in, trying to manage artists' estates and um, legacies. And so. I'm not sure. I think, I think that there. I think art fairs will stay. There might be less, like I said. Um, galleries will stay. They might have to shift in how they work in order to become sustainable. Um, but at the end, it's all in support of artists. So I think that there's a lot of people that have, are very deeply rooted to that cause and like supporting artists and keeping sort of the growth of our cultural history sort of alive and well. Absolutely. So Absolutely. we'll see. Great. Well, I think we're nearing end time. We have about, I think, 10, 10 minutes or so, 10, 15 minutes. Um, so let's open it up. And <laughs> you point to a person. Oh, great. Let's do the front row we'll start out with. Hi. Um, I think you guys do an amazing job telling the story of artists and the nurturing that you give to the galleries. Um, I always come away feeling like I've had a more rewarding experience at your fairs than some of the others. But to that point, there's... What do you think needs to happen for the artists? Because you know you touched on de Kooning's first show at 48. I, I see an underdeveloped artist community. And mm. what, can, what can we do as collectors and um, colleagues and people who are you know, working in all the other dimensions of the art business um, do to help these artists? Because um, there's a lot of bad artists art being made, unfortunately. <laughs> I would mean, say I don't know if that will be solved on the art fair landscape. I think this is actually maybe more a call to arms for curatorial uh, thinkers or curatorial staff to sort of like get back in the ranks, get back in the dirt, get back, you know, on the um, front and like, you know, really be out there mining. It's a lot more than, <laughs> than they've been used to and that has sort of ever been out there, but it's, that, that's the job. And I think once that kind of filtering happens, it's easier for you as, a, as, a, you know, as the art viewing, art curious, art supporting public to then um, get behind something and support. Without it, it feels like that one camp is languishing while other camps that are well developed and sustained just continue to grow and uh, morph into the walls of the actual establishment. So yeah, I think curators need to get also, their hands dirty again. Uh, I was just gonna say there are developing, I mean, and I don't think they're necessarily new, but I'm hearing about them more and more, art fairs that are for artists that are not represented. So it's direct artist representation 
Um, there's one in San Francisco in two weeks um, that has a multi-city sort of platform, and there's there's a few. So I think that's, you know, actually the one in San Francisco is happening in a hotel, sort of a throwback to the Gramercy um, fair. So I think condo, which um, was mentioned before, is a good example of like sort of young art communities like really trying to find ways to, you know, find exposure in a sustainable way. And there's also a lot of curatorial collaboratives happening. Um, there's quite a few on the West Coast, Roberta, mm -hmm. Dolores, Aqua, which people are sharing space. Um, they are co-representing, they are co-curating. And I think these all speak to, you know, what you were asking about as ways of support. I don't know if I answered the question. Great. No. That was a great question. I admire the honesty of it. Thank you. Yeah, a lot of bad art being made. Um, maybe right over there. Hi. My question has to do with video, uh, both in exhibiting and in collecting video. So uh, there are quite a few video artists here in Dallas. And while many of the commercial galleries may be interested in video, there hasn't, it hasn't been successful in terms of building a collector base for those artists. We had a great uh, a gallery that, last, that was showing just digital and video, and it lasted. They were doing really innovative programming, but it lasted two years and folded. And then we're also all of the um, nonprofit spaces that have been the venue for both performance and video are also closing doing, mm. due to many reasons. Most of it has to do with um, real estate cost. And so I just wondered at your events, you know, what have been your strategies in terms of um, exhibiting and, and selling uh, video and installation work? Well, I, I would say you know, it's a really tough, can you hear me? It's a really tough medium um, to integrate into a broad daylight platform for, you know, obvious reasons. Um, and also a market fair platform where the pace is just too frenetic. Um, you know, I think you have to have a different kind of scale of fair for for digital and, and moving image work to, to thrive. Um, so that is important. Also, fairs have to be able to meet the demands of video artists, which isn't necessarily only about devoted space and dark space, but also about sound. Mm -hmm. And sound is a big, big issue in video art. Um, and the quality of sound is, of, is as important as the visual element. A lot of people don't think about that. But that's a very expensive equipment rental uh, or ownership situation. Um, so I think fairs can help with those costs or part, bring in partners to help with those costs. Um, and I think it's, you know, as someone who's worked a lot in video art, you know, I was um, the Kramlet Collection uh, advisor for two years, and then I was um, co-producer of uh, all Brian Tricartan's first 10 uh, movies. Uh, you know, I think there's a lot of um, issues around uh, video art at the moment. Um, there are a lot of great talented artists that need certain kinds of spaces that are completely customized to what the content of the work is about. And I think that that's where fairs really fall short and sometimes where gallerist funds really fall short. So institutions are still going to be the main place for the collecting, the support, the patronage, and the commissioning of video projects. And, you know, collectors that have the ability to work with those museums and assisting in the acquisition of those pieces for those institutions and also potentially having the work, um, you know, and devoting, you know, part of the collection to that, it's still in its infancy stage. Uh, and there's a lot around the additioning, the licensing that I think that model needs to change. It's not a photograph. Uh, you know, it needs to have a totally different structure. Um, and I think it also needs to be more free for a lot more people because I think most collectors that I'm seeing coming in would probably be very interested in owning video works at a much less expensive price point. Uh, so there are some great initiatives like Data Editions run by David Grin, mm -hmm. who's really working with artists to make streamable, uh, affordable 
uh, pieces of, of video art, and I've been collecting a lot of video art myself just from that platform. Um, and then we at Independent uh, took over a theater and invited David to curate a film and video program this year for us that ran all day, every day during the fair, and it devoted space that was, you know, four single channel video pieces uh, by, represented by the galleries at the fair that year. And w there was a lot of collaboration between him and the galleries to do that so that we could have that. But really, we could be doing so much more. It was a great question. Thank you. Anyone else? Yes, all the way in the back. The yeah. <laughs> um, Hi, so I actually um, volunteer with an organization here in Dallas called Vignette Art Fair. Um, I see a few of our other board members. And we have a fair going on right now here that um, represents regional women artists. Um, and we're, we're new, this is only our second year doing it, and we're kind of figuring out how to make make space without being adversarial during a really busy time. We know that you know the, art, the Dallas Art Fair is you know, a big part of what brings the attention to our area during this time, and we're hoping to use that to get some attention for regional artists, and so, um, especially women, of course. So what I'm curious about is any advice that you have as far as navigating that, and like I said, trying not to be adversarial and make that, make that room and make that space and get, get attention. Do you want me to start? Um, I think that the best approach is always like really open communication with the institutions and the larger fair entity that's happening. Um, it doesn't necessarily happen automatically, first year, second year, but when you find ways to collaborate, whether that's um, sharing programming or a shuttle between the venues or some sort of, you know, support and indication of your event at the Dallas Art Fair, for example, um, that's, that's one way. Also organizing sort of, um, I don't want to say like a gallery, it could be a gallery tour or some sort of like larger event that sort of taps into the bigger community that is coming into Dallas, um, I think is helpful. I don't know. Great. Oh, sorry, Elizabeth. Where is your fair? I want to go. Great. <laughs> cool. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you. last year and 60, 63 artists this year. So it's a lot of space and a lot of art. <laughs> cool. Thank you. Great. Uh, maybe one more. Is there anyone else that, yes. Hi. Uh, so much of the discussion today has been uh, about the tension of the exponential growth, growth of the art fairs <clears throat> versus the small single venue galleries. Um, and I was you guys mentioned Kondo and Okie Dokie before. I know Postmasters in New York just joined Patreon, which mm. I thought was really interesting for a small gallery. Is there a particular technology you see that could help solve this problem moving forward outside of the, the Okie Dokie you mentioned? And, mentioned um, and conversely, is there a piece of technology right now you think is really hurting the, the art fair relationship with the smaller galleries? I mean, that's a complicated question yeah, because... I mean, we are. We were discussing this earlier. Uh, we're so far behind yeah. on the digital space. Yeah. It's it's a joke. I mean, it's embarrassing. <laughs> uh, the concept of digital marketing or even being able to really track our true audiences for different artists, uh, different galleries in the fair, different uh, artists that are being represented by those galleries is is really really challenging. It's a very expensive developer. Uh, uh, costs that so you have to create like a multi-million dollar platform and it seems inefficient to do that just to track interest in 12 or 20 artists yeah. uh, for one gallery or you know you know 50 galleries for a, a you know a bespoke you know fair like ours so I think there has to be a lot more development in this area and the thing I think is and I'll say it, it's a slightly controversial, is, is the digital platforms that are marketing art um, that are collaborating with galleries, um, I think have a lot of responsibility in this area to 
offer a degree of transparency to the galleries that they're partnering with for the content um, so that the galleries can still maintain a link to the potential uh, patron of that of any individual artist in the program that's being uh, pushed through a third platform. Um, and this is something that I think best practices could be really useful for. Uh, and I think there needs to be more conversation about it. But we don't have anything that's really working specifically for us yet. There are a lot of startup companies that are trying to do it, mm -hmm. but they're almost trying to outgame the the fair or the right. or the gallery, which I, I you know or compete more in lines with the auction houses, which have a totally different methodology for this. Um, so I think we're just, we really are lacking a lot of potential tools that could be helping moving this along a little bit more quickly. Yeah, it's also that, um, you know, effectively thinking about a technology that maybe bridges those things is more challenging because before you know it, there'll be a whole new advancement in the capacity of the technological realm. And quite frankly, even though it is challenging, I do believe someone who comes up with a model that is like the art fair, like the gallery, or like the auction, is probably who's going to win the space. And, um, you know, because, and we spoke about this earlier, and, you know, um, the, you know, Swiss, who I speak, who, who is the patron of No Commission and whose collection, you know, I work with, he, coming from music, you know, speaks very sort of like, uh, passionately about the turn that the music business has taken with streaming and that in the last year the music business has like had incredible watershed moments in terms of revenue through streaming so there is potentially a corner we can turn in the creative space but I think there's such a gap that we have to cross you know like a vast red sea of like bringing technology and the art world up to speed and then once we get there who is going to cap ca capture the minds, the hearts, the like traditional art viewing public, and also be up to date with the technology and the future capacity for buying, selling, communicating in the digital sphere. And that's a huge enterprise. That's so. what you were saying also earlier about how the, the viral capacity of social media has in some ways been the solution. Exactly. And which it comes out of also music, mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, following and, and this kind of tribal, mm -hmm. viral um, kind of, you know, sharing of, of these experiences and this information mm -hmm. is really driving most of the momentum. The yeah. problem is we just, as data, and to bring it back and to process it and have, have uh, insight about it is something that I think we could use a lot of help with still. Yeah, it's yeah. beyond us. Yeah. It feels in scale at this yeah. moment, but I'm certain someone's going to crack it. <laughs> well, maybe on that mostly optimistic note, I will call it. And I believe Anna mentioned that there's wine. So if you want to continue the conversations um, upstairs, that sounds fun. But uh, I hope you'll join me just applauding and thanking our panelists. For being here.